resolution to make sure that we got democracy in this country. Well, today starts the new American revolution. To make sure that we get our democracy back. So, brothers and sisters, are you ready to stand up? Are you ready to fight? Are you ready to march? Yes, we can! Yes, we can! Yes. Democracy awakening, they call it. Thousands of protesters massing in Washington. All over the country, Americans are fed up. Fed up! Fed up! Fed up! And rebelling against the politicians and the power brokers. I believe that we will win! Fighting against Citizens United. We do not believe that corporations are people. Voter suppression. We will never stop battling. Dark money. The money was hopping from one nonprofit to another, all for the purpose of concealing donors. Gerrymandering. The real work on redistricting was being done behind closed doors. Pressing for reform. If this singing and these chants up on the Capitol steps remind you of the Civil Rights Movement, it should. This is Americans protesting, in this case, against big money in politics, for voting rights, against gerrymandering, against a broken political system. We are the 99%. We are. But as I interview March leaders, I wonder, can it work? Can ordinary voters halt what many see as politicians rigging elections? Can citizen reformers stop the big money that they fear is dominating elections? It's happened before. We the people demanding our rights. A century ago in the progressive era, mass protests won women's right to vote. Direct election of senators. Congress outlawing corporate spending in elections. The 1960s, another rebellion. A grassroots movement challenging the power structure and winning change. Martin Luther King and the March on Washington. Selma, Alabama, and the fight for black voting rights. Today, partisan gridlock blocks change in Washington. And so once again, the grassroots are riled up and rising up, state by state. It's the kind of story I've seen before. In the 1960s, I covered the civil rights protests in the Deep South, reported on the Vietnam War in Saigon the Cold War and Gorbachev's perestroika from Moscow, and covered six American presidents. Today, the states are where the action is on reform. So it's time for me to get out into the country to take the measure of the new wave of grassroots rebellions. First stop, Seattle. Puget Sound, the famous Pike Street Market, I find people gathering for picnic lunch. Fishmongers draw a crowd tossing salmon. It's a peaceful, sunny September day. But rebellion is brewing. So what we're doing today is we're gonna cover the market. A band of volunteers have come to galvanize support for a statewide vote on an initiative to curb billionaire and corporate money in political campaigns, hoping to pressure Congress to take action. Primarily, we're targeting voters that don't know about our initiative, because um, you know the recent polling showed 36% are undecided. It's the initiative 735. Hey, thank you. We need to put the power of the vote back into the hands of the people so that the wealthy entities will no longer have a pipeline. Linda Bach is a modern Paul Revere, awakening the popular rebellion. She collected 21,000 signatures to help put Initiative I-735 on the 2016 ballot. I've long had the idea that I am continuing the American Revolution. Every signature I get is just another check for the Constitution and the power of we the people. Democracy, you must fight for it or it'll slip right out of your hands. Fear that mega money is corrupting our democracy has turned average Americans like Cindy Black into reformers. 
I definitely think the Supreme Court decision of Citizens United has unleashed so much money in our system that it's ceased being a democracy. And now we've turned into an oligarchy. In the Citizens United decision in January 2010, the Supreme Court overturned a century-old ban on corporate political spending. And ruled that corporations can spend freely now on political campaigns. Justice John Paul Stevens dissented. Corporations, he said, already have political action committees, but allowing them unlimited use of their vast treasuries, he warned, unleashes the floodgates. Stevens was prophetic. Suddenly, unregulated campaign spending by independent political groups shot up from $8 million in 2009 to $301 million in 2010 to $1.4 billion in the 2016 election. Changing the Constitution is a big step. In reaction to the Citizens United decision, Senate Democrats pushed for a constitutional amendment to restore the power of Congress to regulate campaign spending. But party-line Republican opposition blocked the move. The motion is not agreed to. Money talks, baby! Money talks! So reformers shifted to the states. Several legislatures called on Congress to roll back Citizens United. 800 cities joined. In Colorado and Montana, 74% bipartisan supermajorities voted against Citizens United. In Washington state, volunteer activist Cindy Black leads the charge for ballot initiative 735. And just by a show of hands, how many of you collected signatures for 735 out there? Give everybody a round of applause, those folks. Because we collected um, 293,000 of our signatures were collected by volunteers. So I have never run a campaign before. I'm really a grassroots organizer. I was in the Air Force. I was a, a crew chief. And then I went to college. I was a marriage and family therapist for quite a few years and then running my own business. Black is the spark plug of a statewide citizen movement. Take your country back. We're trying to get our citizens, our voters on record, saying that we do not believe that corporations are people, we do not believe that money is speech, and that we think that political contributions should be regulated and made public. But others, like corporate investment analyst Kelly Houghton, sharply disagree. I do not want to touch the First Amendment. And this effort, I-735, seeks to restrict the freedom of speech of certain groups of people who come together to form corporations. Citizens United was quite simply a corporation formed for the purpose of engaging in political speech in the form of a movie that Hillary Clinton didn't like. If our forefathers really believed that corporations were people, I think they would have put that in the Constitution, and it is nowhere to be seen. Voting on this issue, would you like to... Okay, they want to censor corporate speech. Let's think about all the things out there that are corporations. Seattle Times, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the New York Times, CNN, Fox News, we cannot afford as a country to censor corporations engaging in free speech. We do not want anything to limit free speech for the press or freedom of the press, not, uh, not at all. What we're talking about is limiting money in elections. Let's give a round of applause for Bouquet! Black has a statewide network of volunteers from the Idaho border to the Pacific coast. It's yeah. not about left or right. I don't care if you're a Democrat, Republican, or other. Yeah. We just want government that represents you, not the big briefcase full of money. But how can amateurs win without big funding? I've talked to professional politicians in this state. They say it takes $3 million to run a successful political campaign in Washington yes. State. You don't have $3 million. No. So what does it take to win in a big state here, Washington State? We talk to people. That's how we're doing it. Contact direct voter contact, person to person. Please tell your friends and family. Okay. You can pass an initiative with a grassroots effort with a small budget. We can do it. And they did it. 63% of Washington state voters rejected Citizens United and unlimited corporate money in campaigns. 
it takes 34 states to force Congress to act on a constitutional amendment. 20 states are now on record against Citizens United. Getting 14 more is the next challenge. Would like a sign to bring anybody else? Okay, to... so rolling back Citizens United is one strategy. But what are the states doing about all those hidden donors? The billionaires hiding behind political nonprofits? Let's have a look at California. How are Sacramento politicians selling Prop 30? Most American election campaigns wind up with a barrage of negative ads. There's no in between. Like this one in California, blasting Governor Jerry Brown's ballot proposal in 2012 for a tax increase to fund education. The fine print names the California Small Business Action Committee as sponsor, but voters are left in the dark about who actually forked up the money. It's dark money, and it's a huge problem in all 50 states. California fights dark money by requiring financial disclosure. So Common Cause activist Derek Cressman, checking an official state website, spots a sudden flood of out-of-state dark money. We saw this contribution of $11 million, a, a huge amount, coming in from this group in Arizona. The money came from a group called Americans for Responsible Leadership, never before active in California politics. But who's this group fronting for? Anonymous contributions are prohibited in California. So Common Cause files a complaint with California's election watchdog, the Fair Political Practices Commission. And we asked them for a formal investigation. Our reaction was just shocked at how large the $11 million contribution was. Because it was the largest anonymous contribution ever in a campaign in California. Commission Chair Ann Ravel is a new kind of sheriff. She wants fast action. My immediate reaction was, yes, it was absolutely, we have to jump on it. We felt it was incredibly important to make sure that the public had the knowledge before election day of who was contributing that money. And the reason is that ballot measures are complicated. And knowing who's behind it, it's like a voting queue. For some people, they have voting queues whether they're going to vote for Republicans or Democrats for candidates. But for ballot measures, knowing who's funding them or who's behind it, those are voting queues. But the time crunch is acute. Less than three weeks to election day. We contacted the Arizona nonprofit. We got a call back from a major Washington, D.C. law firm. And truthfully, that raised our suspicion even more. Because this little nonprofit in Arizona had this big time Washington law firm representing it. The lawyer was Jason Torchinsky. At 36, Torchinsky was already a Top Gun attorney on campaign law for big name Republicans. Winnick tells Torchinsky that California law requires the Arizona group to reveal its funders, but Torchinsky resists. So you get a stonewall from these guys, and That's you right. see this guy, Torchinsky, is connected with a lot of high-powered Republicans. What's your reaction? My feeling was we need to take them to court right then. At Sacramento Superior Court, Winnick and Torchinsky clash head to head. You know, the purpose of the FPPC, Your Honor, is to enforce the law even handedly, not to railroad someone into forcing disclosure. So he and I both showed up in court um, we were saying, if you want to boil it down to its essence, give us the records. Their response, in essence, was, you're not entitled to the records. The judge orders the Arizona group to reveal its records within 24 hours. Tarchinsky appeals to a higher court, forcing delay with time running out. The clock is ticking, and the respondents are doing everything they can do to stall. Ravel decides on an emergency appeal to the state Supreme Court. It's the weekend before Election Day. Unless the court acts, voters will go to the polls still in the dark. The court met on Sunday by telephone, and they decided unanimously that Americans for Responsible Leadership had to submit to the, an audit of the FPPC by 4 o'clock that day. So we get on a call Sunday night, 11.30, probably East Coast time, and so we get into a kind of heated discussion about 
what they're actually going to provide us. Let me say that on Monday morning, I had absolutely no idea what was going to be delivered to me. Monday AM, the Dark Money Network comes out of the shadows, makes a series of revelations. Americans for Responsible Leadership reveals that it got $11 million from the Center to Protect Patient Rights. And the Center reveals that it got $11 million from Americans for Job Security. But the original donors are still a question mark. One stunning disclosure, these groups that were funneling money from one to another were part of the political network of Kansas billionaires, Charles and David Koch. These groups had ties to a fellow named Sean Noble, who was sort of an operative of theirs and knew how to move dark money around. You could clearly see that the money was intentionally hopping from one nonprofit to another, all with names that mean nothing to anyone and no real charitable purpose, all for the purpose of concealing donors. Winnick had stumbled into what Governor Brown calls a money laundering operation. They had to launder this stuff five times. It was so dirty, and, it's, and it still stinks. Election day, the dark money side loses, but voters are still in the dark about who wrote the big checks. Armed with subpoena power after election day, Winnick tracks down two big-time California GOP operatives, Anthony Russo and Jeff Miller. They turn state's evidence, admitting they raised $29 million from rich Californians. For secrecy, they sent donations to the Koch Group, Americans for Job Security, based in Virginia. Why would the Koch Brothers Network have so much appeal to the California political operatives? The Koch Brothers Network had a lot of appeal. They had a network of nonprofits all across the country. It was a great place to hide money. It takes Winnick a year to piece the puzzle together and give voters an inside look into how dark money works. And this is the flow chart we came up with. It went from individual donors to the Americans for Job Security to the Koch Brothers Network. In October 2013, Ravel's agency lowers the boom, finding two Koch groups $1 million for violating California's law on disclosure. And it orders the California Small Business Action Committee to cough up its $15 million in dark money. When I asked for a comment, the Koch brothers' lawyer, Jason Torchinsky, declines. So do the two operatives who raised the dark money. But their attorney, Tom Hitalchek, does not dispute FPPC findings and says that secrecy actually backfired against the donors. You know, I would argue that the controversy actually did more harm to the campaign that they were attempting to support than their money benefited. And so in hindsight, I think they would have been well advised to simply just come clean with who was the source of funds. They hid the names of the true donors. Individual donors escaped disclosure through a loophole in California law. But for the financial audit, Winnick obtains a funding list with donor names blacked out, and the Los Angeles Times manages to decipher the names. Investigative journalists, I guess, held the uh, blacked out piece of paper up to the light. The list is a shocker. Notables like Bob Fisher, chairman of The Gap, mega investor Charles Schwab, Los Angeles philanthropist Eli Broad. The ringleader of this fundraising operation appears actually to have been Charles Schwab. Schwab personally emailed Charles Koch asking for money and praising Sean Noble from your group for helping move the dark money. Koch loaned use of his network, but didn't contribute money. Despite her success, Ravel pushes to tighten California's disclosure law. There were loopholes in the law that we needed to fix. And what we had to fix was the ability to audit prior to the election and the ability to really get disclosure from independent expenditure groups. The measure passes. In 2014, the legislature beefs up the agency's audit powers, closes loopholes, requires disclosure of the 10 top donors for any group spending over $50,000 in a California election. California's tough line against political nonprofits is a model for the country. I think toughening the law is a deterrent and will make those committees think more carefully about 
what they do. Absolutely. The reform actions I saw in California and Washington state were impressive. But after all, those are blue states, progressive states, where you expect reform to be popular. What about a solid red state like South Dakota? Where conservative Republicans have an iron grip on power. Even here, grassroots voters are in a rebellious mood. The tradition of populist rebellion dates back to 1898, when South Dakota became the first in the nation to give citizens the power to overrule politicians through popular ballot initiatives. You know, you just go in, all the candidates would be listed on a single ballot. And so here in Sioux Falls, reformers take their fight directly to the voters. You know, it, it takes control away from the parties, gives it back to the voters. So I'm running for the Senate, but I ain't a big wheel. In 2014, Rick Wyland ran for the U.S. Senate as a Democrat, campaigning on getting money out of politics. Wyland lost, but a ballot measure to raise the minimum wage won a solid majority. Ballot measures are about opening up our democracy and letting people have a voice again, getting people to, uh, to believe that it matters again. Wyland teamed up with his friend Dre Samuelson to form TakeItBack.org, a citizen's movement to take on South Dakota's power brokers. After 28 years in Washington as a Democratic Capitol Hill staffer, Samuelson had given up on D.C. and come back home to push for reforms. So why do it here in South Dakota? Why not just fix the system in Washington? It's not possible to change the system in Washington. There's too much uh, there's too much anger, there's too much hyper-partisanship, there's too much suspicion of the other side. So you're saying the initiative for political reform in America has moved from the nation's capital to the state? That's it. People are turning to ballot initiatives simply because they have no other place to turn. Samuelson and Weiland stitched together an unlikely coalition of South Dakotans across the political spectrum including Sioux Falls former Republican Mayor Rick Noby, now an independent. We don't suffer from gridlock, we suffer from one-party domination. With only 47% of the registered voters, Republicans hold every major state office and 85% of legislative seats. The folks are angry, and justifiably so. With help from national reform groups, Weiland and Samuelson collected more than 20,000 signatures to put an anti-corruption measure, I am 22, on the 2016 ballot. The sweeping reform called for limiting campaign contributions, greater exposure of funders, and giving every registered voter $100 in vouchers to donate to state candidates of their choice. As expected, the state's Republican powers Governor Dennis Dugard and U.S. Senators John Thune and Mike Rounds came out against IM-22. But the heavy opposition artillery came from the powerful political network funded by conservative billionaire activists Charles and David Koch and their flagship group, Americans for Prosperity. The Koch brothers aren't coming in uh, to South Dakota for any reason other than they see this as a very significant fight and they want to be sure that they stop, nip this in the bud before it spreads. South Dakota is divided uh, almost in the middle by the Missouri River. And I found Ben Lee heading the Koch operation in South Dakota and leading a wealthy coalition that ran waves of radio ads and statewide mailers attacking Measure 22. Publicly funded campaigns is a nice way of saying taxpayer funded elections. At a civic debate in Sioux Falls, Lee spoke against public funding. We don't want our tax dollars to be used for attack ads and robocalls at dinner, for postcards, for mailers, and all of those other sorts of things. Those are important tools of the campaign process. We just don't think that the taxpayers should be the folks that are forced to foot the bill. Right now, Corruption in state government costs over $1,300 per person, whereas this would be limited to $9 per person. You wrote an op-ed about this for one of the local papers, and you called Initiated Measure 22 a nightmare. Initiated Measure 22 comes across as a nightmare to me, in part because of its length. With 34 pages and 70 different changes to law, it's, 
It's a monstrosity to try and learn and digest. How much have, has been spent on the Defeat 22 side at this point? I don't have an exact total. We, we're spending hundreds of thousand dollars on our effort. You've stirred up a hornet's nest. You got to stir the pot and you got to whack the hornet's nest to drive change in this country. That's what makes America so beautiful. We can do this and not get thrown in prison. That's how you can make change when the political establishment and the status quo is refusing to do so. Some of these initiatives have a lot of appeal. So Wyland goes on the road and takes me along going town to town. But here in South Dakota. Telling voters that with democracy vouchers, they can spend their own tax dollars to back their favorite candidates. When's the last time you ever got this deal where you could actually take your money that you give to peer and spend it where you want to spend it? And if you want to spend it on someone you think is going to be out there supporting education and supporting you know, better health care, whatever your concerns and beliefs are, you get a chance to do that. News reports of serious corruption in state government angered many South Dakota voters, like Alan Brumer. They say that South Dakota uh, is the fifth most corrupt government in the country. Now, you know, I, I, there's one category we don't want to be up toward the top. Despite the odds against them, reformers rode a wave of anti-establishment anger and won a surprising 52% majority for the anti-corruption measure. The reformers had caught the Republican establishment off guard. Some folks got concerned and said, Mickelson, have you read this? I said, no, but I will. Mark Mickelson is speaker of the state legislature and South Dakota political royalty. Both his father and grandfather were governors. Initiated Measure 22 it is um, 13,000 words, 35 pages, amending South Dakota statute. There were some problems with it. But under South Dakota law, voters have the final say, or so everyone thought. Lawmakers, alarmed by reforms that would help challengers, turned against their own constituents. I've had private conversations with many of you that said, if we don't repeal this, I'm resigning. South Dakota voters did not fully understand what they were voting for. In an unprecedented move, the legislature called a state of emergency and by a party line majority, vetoed IM-22 and simply rejected the will of the people. But popular protests forced lawmakers to adopt some reforms, like limits on lobbyist donations and a government accountability panel, but not public funding of campaigns. The two sides clashed again in November 2018 with rival ballot initiatives. Neither side got all it wanted. The Republican speaker failed to block future citizen initiatives, but he made them harder to pass. Reformers fell short on their new initiative, but already they're gearing up for new reforms in 2020. It's the system that's the problem. It's not the people. It's this, we have to change the system. This legislature, with 85% of Republicans, want to make it more difficult to do that. That just is wrong, and we're going to fight it tooth and nail. So the battle here rages on. But are there states where public funding of campaigns is already at work? I've heard good things about Connecticut, so that's where I head next. The Gold Dome of Connecticut's dignified state capital is an emblem of the Gilded Age, a symbol of the traditional power and influence of a wealthy elite. But poorer neighborhoods in Hartford, New Haven, and Bridgeport lacked a clear voice in state politics. All that changed a decade ago in 2008, when Connecticut implemented public financing for state elections, one of four states using this model reform. Suddenly, new people could run for office, like Navy veteran Gary Winfield, now a state senator from New Haven. Could you have run without this public funding? Could you have afforded it? I could not have run under the old system of financing campaigns. I just couldn't have raised enough money to compete with an incumbent. Or Senator Marilyn Moore, who runs a nonprofit in Bridgeport, helping African-American breast cancer patients. 
I'm a person from a low-income community who had children very young, who did depend on food stamps for a while. I would not have even thought about running for state senate without this funding. They personify the changing face of the legislature. More women, blacks, and Hispanics. Changes triggered by the scandal-driven resignation Please. in 2004 of third-term Republican Please. Governor John Rowland. I acknowledge that my poor judgment has brought us here. Rowland was sentenced to one year in prison for taking $100,000 in kickbacks from state contractors. The public was fed up with corruption. There was a sense that the state, which had prided itself on pretty clean politics, had suddenly become tainted. Today, we begin to restore faith, integrity, and honor to our government. As Rowland's successor, Republican Jody Rell, took her oath as governor, she called for reform. Governor Rell wanted to ban contributions from state contractors and state lobbyists. The Democrats who controlled the General Assembly then were concerned that that would mean the loss of too much campaign revenue. But public pressure turned the tide. The Connecticut Citizen Action Group, an alliance of 50 civic groups, pressed for sweeping reforms tight limits on campaign donations, plus public funding of campaigns. Were there games going on here where the politicians were saying what the public wanted to hear? Namely, we want to do the right thing and have uh, reform. Mm -hmm. But in fact, they were dragging their heels? Yes, and the fact is that in order to get um, the legislature and the governor to embrace truly comprehensive reform, there had to be a lot of grassroots pressure on the outside thousands of phone calls. There were car washes for clean elections. We did all kinds of grassroots activities. Republican Senator Len Fasano, originally a skeptic. Governor Rell sought out senators, including myself. Became a yes vote. Reporters say both parties got dragged into reform. Typically, the party in power and the leaders in the party in power resist either gerrymander reform or campaign finance reform because the system is working for them. How did Connecticut break that? What moved the legislature? What moved the people who liked the system they had? It was a moment in time where the public shaming worked, the outside pressure worked, and finally the inside game decided this was the way to go. The final vote to overhaul campaign finance came at 2.44 this morning. Eventually, it passed in special session. Much to everyone's surprise, we ended up with a system of public financing for legislative races and statewide races. The reform was bold. A tight lid of $100 on all private campaign donations, including lobbyists, plus public grants from $25,000 for House races, $110,000 for Senate, up to $3 million for the governor's race, later doubled to $6 million. To qualify, candidates must first prove popular support by raising a quota of small local contributions. $5 to $100 uh, from individuals that live in their districts. And based on a qualifying amount, we give them public monies to run their campaigns. After that, no more fundraising. But using public funds is voluntary. So no one knew if candidates would do it. But right away in 2008, it took off. Today, it's solid. In 2014 and 2018, 80% of legislators from both parties used public funding. In 2014, all candidates for statewide offices used it. In 2018, three quarters did. Total cost, $12 million for legislative elections, $30 million when statewide offices are also up for election. One big surprise, taxpayers don't foot the bill. No, there's no tax. The, the money that funds the Citizens Election Program comes from abandoned state properties. There's a multitude of monies that come into the state of Connecticut and then are dispersed. What's more, says Senate Republican leader Len Fasano, campaigns are better. I think campaigns are more issue-oriented, more focused on debates. You can have more conversations with your constituency as opposed to raising money. Public funding forces more interaction at the grassroots. They're balancing the budget off the lives of the poor. People are on the bottom. We don't see any of that money in our communities. 
I get how people feel about people in politics, right? I get that. I've, I've been there. It's the reason I'm here, actually. Needing small donors to qualify, Winfield connects with everyday people. The older woman who's living by herself, trying to struggle to get by day by day, who has no way of interacting with me. You have a system of public financing that changes the way that I campaign. And when I knock on her door, she tells me a story I never would have heard. And when I sit in Hartford and I remember that story, some of the policy that I create comes from that story. So more voice for little people, less clout for big money lobbyists. Relationships still matter, but they don't matter because of the checkbook that's in the lobbyist's breast pocket. We saw real changes in the power of lobbyists. We saw reforms in schools to get junk food out of schools. This was a state that was the first state to pass paid sick leave, and the business industry did not have the same kind of power. This bill addresses gun violence prevention. It was also easier, some say, to pass tough gun control legislation after the Sandy Hook school massacre in 2012. Groups like the NRA were not able to influence individual politicians here because they don't fund them. Republicans complained that after the Supreme Court Citizens United decision, Democrats loosened limits on campaign spending by parties and PACs. But in 2014, when Democratic leaders suggested abolishing the entire program to save money, lawmakers in both parties rebelled. There was an uprising. You had members who were drawing lines in the sand. We will not eviscerate the system of public financing. It's too important. The leaders backed down, and now public funding seems embedded. We have had a record of success through five election cycles at this point. If we funded the pure method like we originally had it, I think we were a model for the country. I think the culture has shifted. I think in Connecticut, the culture is that the public financing of campaigns is what Connecticut does. So we've seen several ways to fight big money. But what about the right to vote? The argument between voter fraud and vote suppression. It's a hot issue in a dozen states. And I want to see how it's playing out in North Carolina. Good evening, everybody. I am Rosa Nell Eaton. 92 years old. I am before you today to speak on voting rights. Seven decades ago, under Jim Crow, they made Rosanelle Eaton recite the preamble of the U.S. Constitution to qualify to vote. Without missing a word, I did it. Now she's in a new war fighting against a strict voter photo ID law, a powder keg issue in many states. I am fed up, and fed up, and fed up, and fed up, and up, Thank you so much. Yeah, y'all better say what mama said, fed up. This is Moral Monday, a grassroots movement organized by the Reverend William Barber, an echo of the civil rights movement that won black voting rights back in the 1960s. Tensions are at fever pitch. Demonstrators occupy the state capitol, trying to stop passage of a new law that threatens black voting rights. And they get arrested by the busload. But Republicans who control state government pour on more restrictions. Simply bring your North Carolina driver's license or identification card. We've got a good bill. We've got a bill that ensures integrity of the voting place. It increases voter turnout. and It increases voter integrity. If we look at this bill in its totality, it's all about suppressing the vote. You see those children up there? Those children have been there for the last three hours with tapes around their mouths because they understand what this bill has the potential to do, which is take their voice away. This is a matter that I'm sure many of you are Republican supermajorities steamroll passage, and in August 2013, Governor Pat McCrory signs the tough new voting law. The integrity of our election process is vital to our democracy, which is why I've signed today several common sense reforms into law, including voter ID. It was not a photo ID. It was a monster, mean-spirited, manipulative, very cynical voter suppression bill, the likes of which 
we had not seen since Jim Crow. Absolutely a backlash from the white Republican majority in the state legislature against what we had seen black voting strength do in previous elections. I need you, North Carolina. In 2008, black voters ensured that Barack Obama won North Carolina in that presidential election. Their political power was increasing. The NACP filed suit, and Allison Riggs, an attorney for the Southern Coalition for Social Justice, argued their case in court, contending that the photo ID law was unconstitutional. We put on extensive evidence about um, each provision of the bill and how it would disproportionately impact voters of color. And we put on evidence that the legislature knew about those disproportionate impacts as they designed the bill. They changed the photo ID requirement to keep IDs that white voters most likely had and to get rid of the kind of IDs that black voters were more likely to have. And same thing with same day registration, early voting, out of precinct voting, voting tools more likely to be used by voters of color. Legislative leaders insisted they were fighting voter fraud. Was there something in the record which suggested to you all that there was a problem of voter fraud and that needed to be dealt with. The opportunity to commit fraud was so easy and it would have been foolish to assume that somebody at some point, even if they had not tried it in the past, would try it in the future. During the trial, there was no evidence of voter fraud in North Carolina presented by the state. Instead, evidence showed that 300,000 voters were suddenly disqualified because they lacked proper state ID. And the requirements included a birth certificate, which automatically would disenfranchise a large number of African Americans uh, who were born in segregation by midwives or at home where uh, 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 birth certificates were not issued. Now, Rosanelle Eaton, 94 years old at the time, granddaughter of a slave, a voting rights activist back in the 1960s, ran into all kinds of problems, ran into a runaround. Do you remember any of her testimony, the gist of her testimony? Rosanelle Eaton testified at trial that it took her roughly almost a month to go through all of the hurdles necessary to change documents that had incorrectly spelled her name. A district judge upheld the photo ID law. Then in July 2016, a three-judge appeals court struck it down as unconstitutional, declaring that the law's provisions target African Americans with almost surgical precision for partisan Republican advantage. What happened was they backed off. For Moral Monday, it was a decisive victory. Forward together. Not one step back. Even so, the reform movement faced restricted access to early voting by Republican-controlled county election boards. Many of the counties chose not to have Sunday voting. They chose not to have more than one site. Stand up, fight back. Protesters appealed to the State Board of Elections. Big cities got more polling sites. Some areas got Sunday voting for souls to the polls, marching straight from Sunday services to polling sites. But in 2018, Republican leaders got North Carolina voters to pass photo ID as a constitutional amendment, with the legislature once again to write the details. I put nothing past this legislature. History is against them and they just can't seem to come on into the 21st century. We will never stop battling. And when we're willing to put our bodies on the line, when we're willing to dust off the Constitution and go into the courts, we can win. Next to voting rights and big money, what bothers voters most is politicians rigging elections to hang on to power by manipulating election district maps, gerrymandering. It's a target of citizen reformers in 27 states, nowhere more dramatically than in Florida, where I'm headed next. We don't let foxes guard hen houses or let bank robbers protect banks, but we let politicians draw their own district lines. In Tallahassee, Republican lawmakers are out to squelch reform. 
so it's impossible? May I, may I finish sure. the answer? They're grilling Ellen Frieden, leader of Fair Districts Florida, the citizen reform movement. Let's make one thing clear when we start. Florida is one of the most politically gerrymandered states in the union. It's the reformers versus the power brokers. I represent all the people in Florida who really want to see the partisanship in redistricting stopped. Reformers want to amend the Florida Constitution to bar politicians from manipulating election district maps with the intent to keep themselves in power. Uh, Ms. Frieden, with all due respect, the word intent, the actual intent could only be determined by a court, could it not, as a matter of law? No, I think that the intent starts with you. Lawmakers questioned Frieden for hours, nitpicking comments she'd made to the media. So can you tell me that you disavow those statements? I believe that my words are getting twisted here. So what I'd like to ask, please look at me, I'm, asking, I'm speaking with you. But this is a pretty serious matter. I mean, I, I know you had a six o'clock flight, but we're gonna change the Florida Constitution. I will stay if that is your will. I have put my life into this because it is something that I feel very passionately about. I'm a volunteer. I'm not getting paid to do this. I probably work 80 hours a week on this. If lawmakers intended to intimidate Frieden, their effort backfires. What impact did it have? It got me more committed to, to winning, and it got everybody who was supporting us more committed. Frieden's reformers show voters how gerrymandering stacks the deck. They point to District 3, a weird-shaped congressional district that snakes 200 miles from Jacksonville to Orlando. By packing it with black voters, the Republican legislature gave Democrat Corinne Brown a super safe seat and shifted white voters into nearby districts. That enabled Republicans to win the surrounding districts. It's called bleaching. For a fix, other states like Arizona, Montana, and New Jersey use independent bipartisan commissions to draw election district maps. But Florida's black and Latino leaders oppose that idea, and their support is vital to freedom. There's a kind of high level of mistrust for how these 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 structures work. So, of course, people thought, well, why should I trust an independent panel that is going to be appointed by the elected officials that we're saying are not representative of who we are? We were against that primarily because it didn't take it out of the political realm. It would have ultimately the impact of hurting minority folks' ability to elect candidates of their choice. To get minority buy-in, Frieden offers legal protections and a radically new approach. We made it unconstitutional for legislators to draw districts with intent to favor themselves or their party. Frieden's coalition, spearheaded by Common Cause and the League of Women Voters, collects a million and a half signatures to put its reform on the ballot. And with strong media backing, they build broad bipartisan support among voters. The media's response to the Fair District's movement was incredible. We had editorials from every single newspaper in the state, not only once, not only twice, but probably five or six times at every major juncture. Come election day, Fair District Florida achieves the impossible. 3.1 million Floridians vote for gerrymander reform, a 62.9% super majority. But Republicans who had fought reform also win big, piling up huge legislative super majorities. Then in May 2011, the very same leaders who had savaged Ellen Frieden changed their tune. We have a constitutional obligation uh, to do this right, to make it the most open, transparent, and publicly participatory a reapportionment process in Florida's history. They promised to hold 26 public hearings and to put the whole process online. And making sure that we give citizens the direct say, literally the ability to send in their plans so that we can draw the lines that best reflect the communities that we all represent. It seemed too good to be true, and it was. For proof, look no further than the state of Florida. When the legislature unveils new district maps in February 2012, Ellen Frieden sees instantly that voters have been tricked. The new maps look a lot like the old ones, stacked to favor Republicans. It was gerrymandering with disregard for the Fair District's Amendment is what it was. 
When I saw the Republicans' 2011 redistricting plan, I was disgusted. The Republicans were willing to take the chance of defying the Constitution because they had been pr behaving that way for decades before then. They had legislative leadership had put together this scheme where they were going to act like they were following the Fair District's amendments when in fact the real maps, the real work on redistricting was being done behind closed doors by paid political operatives. It was a double game. Making clear... Orlando attorney David King, representing the League of Women Voters, goes to court to expose the double game. Lawmakers claiming they want maps from the public, but secretly getting their real maps from Republican campaign operatives. And so on a hunch, we, we subpoenaed a series of paid political Republican operatives. And what we got from this subpoena process was a treasure trove of maps and communications. Give me how you got the breakthrough. I presume when you take depositions, take testimony, from the Speaker of the House, the Majority Leader. They basically don't tell you a lot, but you gotta have somebody spill the beans. Who spills the beans and how do you get that? Well, it turns out one of the political operatives, Mr. Reicheldurfer, was a, a hoarder. He kept all his stuff. He had it in his computer. His computer should be like on the National Register or something because it had like 150 maps. Mark Reicheldurfer was a professional consultant for the Florida Republican Party. Sir, raise your right hand to be sworn, please. And a longtime political pal and personal campaign manager for the Republican yes. House Speaker. Mark Reicheldurfer's files were the smoking gun. We had emails coming from Speaker Cannon. We had emails coming to Mark Reicheldurfer from other political operatives who were working at the Republican Party of Florida. Mark Reicheldurfer was a, a hub of communications. These operatives drew the maps and then they found people in the community, in the Republican community, to actually file the maps with the legislature. One unwitting fall guy was then 22-year-old Florida State University student Alex Posada, a former Republican Party intern. Posada says congressional district maps were submitted without his knowledge from an email address of his that he rarely used. Months later, under oath, Posada says he never submitted any maps. With computer sleuthing, attorney Fritz Wormuth traces the bogus Posada maps to Frank Terraferma, a Florida Republican Party strategist. Oh, right me. In court, Terraferma admits drawing and circulating district maps. I shared my maps. I didn't put a, a patent or copyright on them. If someone thought they were good enough to be submitted, I'm certainly more than happy that they were submitted. And we found that his maps had more districts that actually turned up in the final legislative maps than any of the others. A circuit court judge finds the legislature engaged in conspiracy and illegal gerrymandering. The judge orders maps redrawn for two congressional districts, but lawmakers made only minor tweaks. We had to appeal to the Florida Supreme Court the High Court's ruling in July 2015 is a political earthquake. It rebukes the legislature for partisan gerrymandering with unconstitutional intent and orders eight congressional districts redrawn. The state Senate then admits its maps were also illegal, and they're thrown out. When I saw the Supreme Court's decision, I started trembling. It was a complete and total vindication of all we had been working for for all these years. The courts relied heavily on maps drawn by Fair Districts Florida, which had immediate impact in 2016. With more competitive districts, five congressional incumbents are ousted. Political newcomers win, like former Orlando Police Chief Val Demings and Rollins College Professor Stephanie Murphy. And in 2018, reform brought more new winners. So what do you think the lesson or the message is for the rest of the country? The message is that our political system in this country can be fixed. And my answer to somebody who would complain would be, get out there and fix it. If we can do it in Florida, you can do it in your own state. I believe that we will win. Energized by such victories, grassroots activists made 2018 a boom year for reform. 
in five states, Ohio, Michigan, Missouri, Colorado, and Utah, they won gerrymander reform. In Maine, Florida, and North Dakota, citizen movements passed election law reforms. Seven states made voting and voter registration easier. And cities like Baltimore, Denver, Phoenix, and Portland, Oregon adopted public funding of campaigns. We are seeing activism, the likes of which we haven't seen in decades. There is enormous opportunity to move reforms because people are hungry for concrete action they can take in this moment.